Hi, everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon. I hope your day started well. Uh, my name is Gabriela Masfarré, and I am part of the Healthy Communities Initiative team at the Canadian Urban Institute, orchestrating Canada's placemaking community. It's been a while since our last mobilizer session in May, but we have been very lucky to be able to uh, meet with many of us and connect over the summer through the sense-making sessions hosted uh, with Happy Cities. We are very excited to be back with all of you today in this special session that marks an important milestone for our team with the launch of the power of placemaking and all the resources attached to this project. With this project, we aim to really shine light on how relatively small amounts of funding can go a long way in strengthening social ties and our collective well-being. Before we start, I want to share with you a couple of friendly Zoom reminders. Uh, so this session is available in English and in French. And actually, some of our panelists today, is, uh, today are French speakers. So please do make sure that you select your preferred channel. Uh, to do so, you will see that on the bottom of your screen, there is a menu and there is one of the buttons that has a globe. If you click there, you will be able to select your preferred channel, English or French. Also, closed captions have been uh, activated in English for this webinar, so please feel free to turn them on if you want them. And if at any point you have any technical issues, make sure that you communicate uh, with our team through the Zoom chat. We will be able to provide you support. Um, also, uh, you, as some of you may know, by uh, participating in previous sessions, we like to make these sessions as interactive as possible. So we are going to share on the chat a collaborative notes document, which will allow us a little bit to share a bit more about what you're doing, your projects, your initiatives, your ideas, etc., so that we can bring a bit more than what we can share on the Zoom chat. My colleague Emily is going to be sharing it in a minute on the chat. And also to warm up this virtual room, we really invite you to share with us kind of like your name and where are you joining today so that we can warm up the space together. We want to open this space by recognizing the ongoing impacts of colonization and the fact that reconciliation is an ongoing commitment in all of us. We are grateful to have the opportunity to live, to congregate, to learn and to work in this territory as community builders, and we commit to taking care of the land and all its beings with whom we share it. Um, our work at the Canadian Urban Institute happens across Turtle Island, which is the traditional territory of many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Metis people. And today I am joining from the traditional territory of the many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. Toronto is covered by Treaty 13, signed by the Mississaugas with the Mississaugas of the Credit, and the Williams Treaty, signed with multiple Mississaugas and Chippewa bands. Today's session and everything that will follow this session has been possible thanks to a collaborative effort with many people and organizations from the initial steps really envisioning this project all the way until the final details, it would not have been possible to achieve everything that we are gonna be sharing today with you without the team, without the support of our technical partners, with this, uh, without the support of our translator and many other people. So I wanna take a minute also to appreciate everyone's general involvement uh, with this piece of work. And in this regard, I am very glad to be joined today by my colleague from Community Foundations of Canada, Michelle Bridger. Uh, so I'm going to pass it over to you, Michelle. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me here today. Um, I'm joining today on the unceded and unsurrendered territory of the Anishinaabeg people, sometimes known as the Algonquin, here in Ottawa. As a person with um, a mixed a mixed relationship to um, her ancestry, I have both recent immigrants and a deeply rooted settler history in Canada, 
And I'm constantly on a journey to do more for reconciliation and our future generations. So I am very excited to be here today on behalf of Community Foundations of Canada as part of a small and mighty team supporting your Healthy Communities Initiatives funded projects. And I'd like to welcome you to this session where we will learn from the great work that's been led by the Canadian Urban Institute and Happy Cities on research into the effects of community-driven place-based initiatives on our individual and collective well-being. And also here's from some projects today. So the Healthy Communities Initiatives generated significant interest in terms of projects across the country. And we're happy to be able to support this amazing learning initiative to expand the usefulness of this program. I look forward to learning about how you've embraced the HCI themes to transform public spaces and how this work can be useful for all of us. So thank you so much. And I hope you enjoy the session today. Thank you so much, Michelle. Um, it's great to have you here with us too. And um, today we're also very thank you, uh, thankful, sorry, to be joined by our colleagues, uh, Mitchell Riordan and Leah Carlberg from Happy Cities, with whom we've been working very closely these last couple of months. Um, so it's great to have them back here and to share with us everything that, that has been learned as well as some of these stories. In the first part of the session, Mitchell and Leah will uh, present some of the evidence and stories on the impacts of placemaking in, in, on our well-being, sorry. And then on the second part of the session, Mitchell and Leah will be joined by four fantastic panelists. They are four pra practitioners from really across the country, all of them working in projects that benefited from the Healthy Communities Initiatives. And they will be sharing in their own words, their own stories, learnings and experiences. So with us, we have today Simon Paradis and David Duchette uh, joining from Montreal, who are part of Mission Echeco. Um, they will share their experiences working with people who are at risk of exclusion. Specifically, they will talk about the initiative called Ide Acción Mobile. Joining from Red Deer, Alberta, we have with us also Rene Michalak uh, from Rethink, Rethink Red Deer. Uh, Rene will be sharing his experiences on food security, climate action, and reconciliation through the Common Ground Garden Project. And finally, we have with us also Kupcha Keislamushin, who will be reflecting on his experiences as a volunteer of the Oppenheimer Bicycle Repair Clinic, a, a clinic hosted by the Pedal Foundation and based in downtown Vancouver. I wanna remind everyone that at the end of the session, we will have some time for questions. So please, if at any point you have questions or there's point that you, points that you would like to explore a bit more in detail, in detail, make sure that you share your questions through the chat and our team will be able to collect them. And I also want to thank you for taking the time today to be with, uh, with all of us. I think this is everything from my end. So I am gonna pass it over to you, Mitchell and Leah. Welcome and thank you to Gabriella and Michelle for the wonderful intro. I'll just take a moment to share my screen. One moment, please. Can everybody see this okay? Awesome. And so my name is Leah Carlberg and I'm an urban planner with Happy Cities based in Vancouver, where we live and learn on the unceded territory of the Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh and Musqueam First Nations. I'm joined today by my colleague, Mitchell. I'll let him introduce himself. Hi everybody. My name is Mitchell Reardon, I'm Director of Urban Planning at Happy Cities and also based on the traditional and unceded territories of the Squamish, Musqueam and Tsleil-Waututh Nations. Thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, we're thrilled to have this space to connect with so many of you, perhaps a number of people who we were able to interact with during our earlier sessions, as well as everyone who's here because you're excited to learn more about the power of placemaking. And so before we get started with our presentation, we have a quick poll so that we can hear from you over, it looks like almost 150 people joining today. And I'll bring up the poll. So you should be able to see this poll now. The question we're posing to you today is, um, what brings you to today's session? 
And there's a number of options. I believe you're welcome to, oh, you're welcome to choose one answer. Um, and I'll give you a moment for everybody's choices to come in. Thank you, I see where the numbers are trickling in. I'll give just 20 more seconds. Anybody else would like to add to the poll here? Okay, well, thank you so much. We are quite thrilled to be able to hear from you and what brings you to today's session. One moment, the poll. Sorry, the poll screen is in my way here. Um, sorry about this. Okay, the poll is out of my mind. I'm so sorry about that. And so again, thank you. And we'll just jump right into it. I do apologize for that little technical difficulty. So first we'll start with a story. When the pandemic hit Silton, Saskatchewan, a rural community of less than 100 people, residents took action. A group of community members noticed an empty space beside town hall on the village's uh, main street. Together, they came up with a vision for a new space that would allow physical distancing and social connection. With support from the village council, they applied for an HCI grant and built a giant wooden deck. They called it the platform, refer referencing the railroad tracks that run through the town. The platform is a fairly simple space. It's a large deck with good lighting and power outlets. It offers a central space that's free outdoors where residents can gather and connect. And people in the community host everything from paint nights to ukulele classes, flower shops, clothing exchanges, and more. An annual concert series at the platform has become a very popular event. It's grown from 100 participants in the first year to 400 recently, with downtown Silton becoming a destination for the region. This project in Silton is a great example of placemaking. And if you haven't heard the term before, we have a light definition here. Placemaking refers to community-led or supported initiatives that aim to improve a place. These projects may take the form of murals, benches, community gardens, open streets, a variety of programs and activities often led by community members, and so much more. In Silton, the platform acted both to transform a space physically and also to inspire programming and activities, all of which acted to bring people together. And with placemaking, the process of collaborating is as important as the outcome. A participant from one of our recent sessions said it perfectly, that fundamentally placemaking is about strengthening the connections between people. One of the great things about placemaking is that it is open to everyone, whether or not you really call yourself a placemaker. And in many cases, placemakers might be city staff, local businesses, community organizations, and people of all ages, abilities, and backgrounds. I have no doubt that we have a range of these voices with us today on the call. And we also want to note that placemaking projects are really dependent on their contexts. Each project should be created for and by the communities they serve. Projects will also vary based on hyperlocal problems, the available resources for the community, as well as people's vision for change. Now, we're all here today, at least in part because of the Healthy Communities Initiative or HCI. HCI is a $60 million project funded by the Government of Canada, which provided over a thousand grants to community organizations, really from coast to coast to coast across Canada, from Silton to St. John's, from Montreal to Victoria, and many more locations. These projects took many shapes, each aiming to promote social equity through creative, context-specific placemaking solutions. And while funding from HCI has closed, the initiative continues to support a network of placemakers, for example, offering the space for us today. And following these many projects, HCI had a number of questions that were top of mind, questions that they wanted to answer and explore, like 
How do community-driven place-based initiatives affect our individual and collective well-being? And what is the long-term legacy of these initiatives since the pandemic? They were also wondering what happens when we put resources directly into the hands of communities? And how does placemaking help build capacity and resilience? I'll hand it over to Mitchell to share what came next. But we're thinking about this stuff all the time at Happy Cities, and we were so excited to partner with the Healthy Communities Initiative and Canadian Urban Institute to research the well-being impacts of placemaking. And Happy Cities is an urban planning consultancy, and we specialize in placemaking, engagement, and well-being impacts of the built environment, turning evidence into action for happier, healthier, and more inclusive communities. To understand the well-being impacts of placemaking, we organized the work into two areas. We conducted desk research where we explored the quantifiable well being impacts of placemaking. And we conducted a series of online engagement sessions where we hosted focus groups for people involved with HCI projects and people who were involved in placemaking in some way from across the country. The desk research had an emphasis on measurable data, which there isn't a lot of right now. Um, so we also did a meta-analysis of all the public life studies Happy Cities had conducted in order to help to build the, the body of research. There's a lot of stuff that was saying, you know, placemaking is good, and that was in a peer-reviewed article, but we wanted to get beyond that into hard data that we could use to motivate why placemaking is important uh, for the project here and for all of the work that you do. And we were focused on uh, the well-being impacts of placemaking, a series of key themes, and all of it was reviewed by a number of uh, our HCI partners, which we were very grateful for. For the online sessions, uh, they took place between June and September 2023. We had over 100 participants sh share their stories, and this came from, you know, all aspects of community-based placemaking, residents, city staff, community groups, funders, and many more. And the topics for each of this are each of the sessions had various topics, uh, and they included placemaking for all ages, um, small town and rural placemaking, a couple of general placemaking sessions, digital placemaking, and more. And the findings from this work have been distilled into two reports the power of placemaking evidence and stories and the engagement summary report, both of which are available as of today at placemaking.ca slash power of placemaking. And we'll be sharing you know, the tip of the iceberg of those findings, but I uh, encourage you to take a look there at all of the resources that are free to download in both English and French to help uh, support the work that you're doing. Through this work, six key themes emerged um, and we'll be highlighting some of those today. They were safety and comfort, social connection, vibrant economy, belonging and inclusion, physical and mental health, and climate resilience. And participants from the sessions highlighted these things. The, the desk research also brought uh, a range of data related to this to the foreground, and we were able to, to dig into it. So let's start with social connection. What we found was that people with strong social relationships are happier, healthier, and live longer on average than those who feel lonely and isolated. And placemaking can play an important role in facilitating conversations among strangers and strengthen community connections. A multi-city European study in Barcelona, Canuts, Dutin, Kem, and Stoke-on-Trent found that loneliness decreases with each additional hour that people spend visiting public green spaces, places with street trees, parks, water, and other natural features. A little bit closer to home, funding from HCI helped to create a small community center in Dawson City, where Healthy Families, Healthy Babies was working to help new parents create a support network. The space hosts a variety of programs, including pre and postnatal care, sewing, moccasin making, local herbal remedies, food processing, and more. The space allows new parents to connect for hours every day, share resources and stories, and build relationships, which, if you're a new parent like myself, can be a little bit challenging. In a setting where the majority of community members don't have family in the area and with hardships such as extreme climates and limited access to entertainment and other resources, these social connections play a key role in community well-being, especially at a stage in life that can be isolating like early parenthood. 
And across numerous uh, engagement sessions, we asked uh, a poll question. What are the key well-being benefits of placemaking? And the top three responses that we heard were creating more social connection, strengthening community inclusion, and fostering a greater sense of meaning and belonging. And this truly speaks to the power that placemaking can play to support social connection and inclusion, and in doing so, foster community resilience, which is just critical in a time where disasters, natural and otherwise, seem to be occurring on a, a very regular basis. Next up, we looked into safety and comfort. We found that people of different genders, races, ages, and abilities have different experiences in public space, and that co-created spaces and events that are tailored to meet the needs of specific groups help to ensure that everyone's needs are met. An example out of the United States, street murals can do more than just create a sense of place. They can make streets safer for walking, biking, and rolling. Across the US, cities have been working with residents to install murals and curb bump outs to slow traffic on the street. And a Bloomberg Philanthropies study of 17 of those intersections observed a 50% decrease in crashes with vulnerable road users, such as pedestrians and cyclists, as well as 25% fewer dangerous conflicts between drivers and pedestrians. So we can fulfill more than one thing through a placemaking project. We can build community by doing it together and make streets safer, as this example shows. In another case, in North Park, Victoria, a pop-up community center was funded through HCI. The North Park is a diverse mixed income and mixed use community near Victoria's core. It is a culturally diverse neighborhood and hosts many of the city's social services. During the peak of the pandemic, over 100 people were living in emergency tents in the neighborhood's central park. With funding from HCI and support from the city of Victoria, the North Park Neighborhood Association developed a pop-up community center. This pop-up space offered free services such as weekly grocery hampers, phone check-ins to help seniors, and informational resources. The program served over 700 people, including housed and precariously housed residents alike. And I'll pass it over to you, Leah, to share a few more findings. Thank you. Another outcome that we associate with placemaking is a more vibrant economy. And we found that vibrant places draw more foot traffic, generating customers and income for businesses. Thriving local businesses also contribute to a more robust community in general, providing jobs and destinations. A study on the impacts of a placemaking program to support patios for restaurants in Toronto found that participating restaurants saw an increase in total revenue by over 30%. In total, this came out to be over $170 million in additional revenue for the group of restaurants who participated in this project. And in Montreal, pedestrian streets were found to improve business vacancy rates by 9% over the course of five years. That was over the last five years where other cities have struggled with their vacancy, especially in downtown cores. In addition to these stats, we heard real examples of how placemaking is boosting the economy across Canada. One such story was shared with us from a participant who called into one of our sessions from Tech Toyak Tech. Taktoyaktak is a community along the Arctic Ocean of just a thousand people, 95% of whom are Indigenous, and over 30% of residents produce traditional arts and crafts as a means of livelihood. However, the pandemic prevented artists from being able to gather and travel, for example, to attend workshops and courses that are part of their livelihood. In response, the Taktoyaktak Community Corporation partnered with the local Aurora College to create a local makerspace and offering small-scale manufacturing equipment to the community. The pilot started with a pretty small selection of commonly used tools and was very well received. Through an HCI grant, the project expanded to bring in 3D printers and additional equipment. The makerspace now provides educational opportunities and it helps artists and craftspeople produce items for online sale. And it also provides opportunities for skill development and business incubation. One of our sessions focused specifically on rural settings and the impact that placemaking can have uh, on well being on well-being in these small towns and rural communities. And what we heard is that rural settings are unique, and in many cases, success in these communities is defined a little bit differently than in urban centers. For example, low participation levels might still be considered a success, and projects might take additional time and trust as relationships grow and the project gain mom gains momentum in the community. 
We also heard that many rural placemaking projects are acting as essential tools to meet really acute community needs. So for example, early infant care, as Mitchell mentioned, um, in Dawson City, nutrition, other needs as well. A participant who called in from Newfoundland shared, I've noticed that often it takes longer than I'd like for people to be able to organize their lives so that they can participate in placemaking opportunities. Perseverance gives folks time to be able to participate. Another theme we explored was belonging and inclusion in community settings. And people who feel a strong sense of belonging are healthier, more productive, more trusting, and generally live longer. And when people are involved in shaping their community spaces, for example, painting a mural or organizing a block party, then they're more likely to feel a sense of care for those places. A national survey in the United States found that the leading factor in whether people feel a sense of attachment to their community or not is if they have community events and places to meet people. But not all neighborhoods have the same access to free places to gather, such as parks. And this disparity is especially visible in lower income communities across the states and Canada alike. We heard some really great stories about the impact of placemaking projects on fostering a sense of belonging and pride in place. During the pandemic, the Downtown Halifax Business Association started organizing outdoor light shows to create a safe, free outdoor activity for residents in the wintertime. In response to community suggestions, the light shows have been planned around different events, including International Women's Day, Micmac History Month, and March Break shows that cater to families and kids. Other shows have paid tribute to African Nova Scotian heritage and the 1917 Halifax explosion, which was a historic event that many seniors remain closely connected to, and many of whom shared that they were greatly moved by the show. The events have been a huge hit in Halifax and are now running for the third year straight, with 17 shows planned for this winter. When led by diverse community members, placemaking can foster inclusivity enabling communities to tell their own stories and rewrite the narratives associated with their surroundings. From participants at the sessions, we heard several ways that placemaking projects have helped to rewrite the story of a place or to tell an untold story. A few of these ways are noted here. So for example, placemaking can create new narratives of a place. It can provide opportunities for storytelling and connection, whether those are formal opportunities through a placemaking project or whether it casually happens through the interactions along the way. Placemaking can also provide an opportunity for cultural expression and have long-term impact and share the legacy of a voice or group in a space. Placemaking can be welcoming, inclusive, and empowering. And in many cases, we heard that people involved in placemaking projects um, are the voices that aren't always present in civic decision-making processes. So voices such as youth, families, seniors, and newcomers to Canada. Another topic that we explored was health, including physical and mental health. So placemaking can encourage walking, rolling, biking, play, and new social connections, all of which contribute to a healthy lifestyle and contribute to our health both physically and mentally. One example that we found is that for over two decades, Belgian cities have closed a number of neighborhood streets to cars for part of the day during summer vacations. And the purpose of this project is to give children space to play. Many of these streets are supervised and equipped with activity areas specifically for kids. And a 2013 study of these play streets found that street closures led kids to sit, to sorry, to stand and move 64 minutes more per day and spend 14 more minutes per day in vigorous play and activity. Of course, this active play is key for healthy childhood development. For example, boosting self-esteem, reducing stress, and generally preventing childhood obesity. One last story to share that we heard in the sessions. In Musumin, Saskatchewan, winter weather spans about half the year. And with COVID restrictions in place, the Parks and Rec Department of the town was unable to offer public indoor skating, which is usually a popular activity. As a result, the town set out to create outdoor skating paths that would get people outside and active. The town flooded and froze 500 meters of the park roadway, allowing people to skate together while remaining physically distanced. And with HCI funding, the town expanded the winter skating program, creating three tracks and grooming 13 paths as cross-country ski trails. 
From our sessions, we were also able to hear from a number of city staff. So for example, staff from Musumin and others. Specifically, we heard that placemaking is often used in cities to meet other goals, such as economic revitalization or safe streets. Placemaking is also often supported by various city departments, but not prioritized on its own by any one particular department. We heard a lot of success stories from cities leading or supporting temporary interventions and programming. For example, taking the form of seasonal street closures or festivals or the Bradley Park skating routes. Staff also shared some barriers with us. A main barrier is that placemaking is often seen as a pretty nebulous um, activity. It doesn't necessarily get its own level of priority or secured funding on an ongoing basis. A staff member shared with us that Depending on who's in charge, you have to sell your projects in different ways. For some, it'll be a focus on benefiting local business and for others, supporting active transportation. One of the more challenging aspects of this work is constantly reevaluating while trying to accomplish things. I'll pass it off to Mitchell for a few more items we want to share. Beyond these six core themes, uh, we also heard an array of adjacent overlapping well-being benefits that were achieved through placemaking. Uh, they included fostering a sense of belonging by you know, celebrating community, but also partic participating in these placemaking activities, strengthening pride in place through the storytelling, as Lee had mentioned, revitalizing public space, so just making the most of, of the spaces that exist, which I think we're going to hear a little bit more from our panel, changing perceptions of space, and offering capacity building opportunities to get involved in civic processes and demonstrate the responsiveness of uh, local government. At the same time, we also heard about some additional challenges and barriers. In many of the sessions we asked, you know, what would improve the placemaking process for you? And the top answers were additional funding, communication support to help spread the message about the activities, opportunities to connect with other practitioners to share ideas, and mentoring opportunities where a practitioner with experience in a similar field could share that with someone who is interested but unsure about how to move forward. Through both the desk research as well as the online focus groups and, and other engagement, a number of insights for the future of placemaking emerged. Most critically, it was evident that core needs need to come first. Placemaking projects can serve acute needs, as we saw in Dawson City, and can provide solutions to local issues. But it's critical that funding for placemaking projects doesn't replace funding for core services and resources. Placemaking can help to support, but it isn't a stopgap and it isn't something to replace you know, core funding that needs to be in place. Funding also needs to match placemaking goals and timelines. And we found funding opportunities rarely provided certainty, uh, especially for projects with longer implementation timelines. And those longer timelines are, are really important when working with vulnerable communities, nonprofits, and in rural settings, where there may not be the structure, support, and connections needed to quickly secure funding, access resources, and connect with the populations that will be involved. And we also encourage seed funding to test ideas and explore proof of concepts, help reduce barriers to participation and expand access and encourage innovation within the placemaking realm. So a little bit of money to just test an idea out, but with confidence that there's more that would be available if it is validated. Beyond this, we heard about the importance of equipping communities with knowledge and resources. So having more access points that make it easy for people to get involved or lead community initiatives to help expand representation in placemaking greater awareness raising and knowledge sharing, application guidance, low barrier applications for placemaking projects, as well as funding and mentorship. And we hope to be that the resources we're sharing uh, on the community placemaking website uh, help to do so. We also are encouraging more national funding opportunities like HCI. They're really well suited to ensure equitable access to placemaking across the country. And in the absence of consistent national funding, a national community of practice and best practice resources for soliciting, evaluating, supporting, and sustaining placemaking can help to fill this gap. And finally, it's so important to measure what matters. So we want to measure impacts. Uh, ideally, a flexible and replicable evaluation approach uh, is a valuable way to help measure impacts for placemaking in a variety of settings, 
uh, low barrier, so really easy to do, say, before and after testing, and just help evaluate uh, for consistency in how city staff, funders, community groups, and individuals are reporting the impacts of their work. This is great for validating individual projects, as well as placemaking as a whole. And through all of the work that we were so fortunate to be involved with, it, it emerged so clearly how, uh, you know, the HCI program funded more than a thousand projects across the country, from east to west, north to south, urban, rural, and in between. And during a time of social division, where it's social division is making the headlines almost every day, placemaking is a unifying force from coast to coast to coast. And I think that's something to be really proud of and why it needs to be sustained as such a critical aspect of our work. So what's coming ahead? Oh, uh, we have the poll. Sorry. Um, da, da, da. What's ahead? OK, so we have the public resources um, that we've shared at placemakingcommunity.ca, Power of Placemaking. You're going to see uh, evidence and stories uh, shared in snapshots, which can be easily uh, downloaded and shared in your own presentations. Uh, and we're looking to continue to support initiatives across the country, so spaces for collective storytelling and peer learning like today. And we really hope that the evidence, data, and stories uh, help to secure funding and support new placemaking projects for folks who are on the calls, and we really encourage you to share it beyond uh, this location as well. Um, have a look, and if you think uh, it's helpful, consider sharing these with your networks. And uh, you're also welcome to join Canada's placemaking community by signing up for the newsletter, sharing stories, contributing your best practices, data, photos, and more. And um, yeah, again, just uh, when you have a chance, check out the findings, which you can find at placemakingcommunity.ca slash power of placemaking. And here's the cover of these lovely reports. And with that, we're going to ask a second poll question to everybody here. What are the top well-being benefits of placemaking for you? And the poll should have just popped up. And this one is multiple choice. And Leah and Gabrielle, I'm not sure if you're able to, to share any of these polling answers. Sounds good. It looks like most answers have been received. Our top answer is creating more social connections at 70%, followed by fostering a greater sense of belonging, followed by strengthening existing social bonds. Oh, sorry. Actually, the next most popular one would be creating opportunities for intergenerational relationships and interactions. Thank you, Leah. And seeing some really good answers in the uh, chat as well. Uh, you know, questioning established priorities and agendas. Yeah, absolutely. Um, people noting how hard it is to really pick top impacts. Collective stewardship. Collaboration for bottom-up problem-solving coordination and innovation. And with that, we're going to be shifting over to our panel. And we are so fortunate to be joined by a really accomplished group today who've been involved with a series of HCI projects. So we'll ask uh, Rene, David, Simon, and Kupcha to turn on your cameras now, please. And we'll give you the space to, to introduce yourselves and your work. Alors, je peux y aller. Euh, bonjour à tous à travers le monde. J'ai vu qu'il y avait des gens qui nous suivent dans la Nouvelle-Zélande. Uh, My name is Simon Parazzi, responsible for partnerships funding at Execo since last December. I've been here for almost one year. Execo is an organization that works on inclusion and equity. We create uh, freedom spaces 
where everyone will have the opportunity to express themselves and uh, we do our best so that nobody uh, feels any pressure. So we're in Montreal. Merci, Simon. David? David. Hi, everyone. Good day. I will do a presentation in bilingual. I try. try. So I'm David. I'm working with Simon at Execo. I'm the project manager for ID Action Mobile. And uh, during my presentation, I will show you some picture. ID Action Mobile, we, are, uh, we have a van. It's a library. So the mobile is because we're going to the park, to the subway station and different shelter to meet uh, houseless people and create a, a humanization relationship. Voilà. Merci, David. Uh, Rene, we'll go over to you. Hi, everybody. My name is Rene Mikulak. I'm the project manager for the Common Ground Garden Project in Red Deer, Alberta. We're under the uh, watch of Rethink Red Deer, and our project's purpose is to bring people together in the great outdoors on a brownfield site and turning it into what I would call a green field. So we're setting up an urban agriculture farm and growing food for the food bank and the mustard seed and social organizations that have the time and interest to join us, uh, hosting elementary schools and summer camp and really making a dynamic place to uh, practice active reconciliation with our Indigenous communities as well. So we've uh, made some progress uh, very good this year and look forward to continuing building our relationships and growing more food because we seem to be in a factor of doubling every year with our food production and relationships with uh, the groups participating and people learning about and becoming aware and visiting the site. So really happy to be part of the panel today. Wonderful. Looking forward to hearing more about your work at Rethink Red Deer, Renee. And over to you, Kupcha. Oh, and I think you might be muted, Kupcha. Okay. I was hitting the wrong unmute button. My pardon. Uh, so my name is Kupcha. Um, I am with our community bikes in here in the uh, unceded territories of Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh, and Squamish out in uh, kind of Downtown East Side is where we do a lot of our work at the Oppenheimer Park Clinic, uh, bike clinic. We do a lot of beautiful uh, repair work for uh, the community members there and host uh, space where they can utilize the tools if they've got the skills themselves. And there's a lot of skill sharing and um, a lot of networking of uh, the, the space. Um, our community bikes, they... Uh, they also hold some functions at a couple different other spaces too, but um, yeah, I, I'm a little anxious today because I, um, <laughs> I thought I was actually going to be a part or viewing, not really participating today. So I'm a little discombobulated, but thank you uh, for your patience with this. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to leave it right there for now because I've got to compile a little, little, stuff in my mind for for moving forward but uh yeah oh i forgot to mention i'm i'm with our community bags i'm i'm actually just a volunteer um i've been working with them for about a year um and i've got a couple of stories that i'm looking forward to sharing about kind of how they hold space and and that kind of thing so yeah i look forward to speaking about that Thanks. Well, thanks so much for joining Kapsha and for, you know, rolling with the, the shift that you uh, may not have anticipated. We really appreciate you speaking about the fantastic work that the Oppenheimer Bicycle Repair Clinic has done and, and all of the work you're doing. So we have a great group here, um, you know, touching on active mobility, um, offering resources for people at risk of homelessness or who are experiencing homelessness. Uh, as well as food production. And all of this is really about relationships, capacity building, and more. So just like to, to open it up by um, asking each of you to, to share a little bit more about your work and how your, your organization um, you know, enables connection in public space or support through community programs. And maybe we'll start with Idée Action. So Simon and David. Should I begin, Simon? Go ahead, David. 
Okay, so uh, let me just show you a couple of pictures because uh, it's gonna be more easy for you to understand what is a uh, Ideaxon Mobile. Alors, uh, I'm gonna share uh, just here. First, like I say, we are a van here, a library van. So we're going in the park. So as your question, sometimes the request come from uh, some the city administration, like this one from a Côte des Neiges à Montréal, the Martin Luther King Park. They just say, oh, we have a social cohabitation problem. So we don't come here to resolve the problem. We're going there just to say, come, oh, how we can put a peace environment, just a chill spot when the people can came or not. So our objective as we think we can change the population or make uh, a change in the environment, it just be there by example, just say, come, hey, here we are, we are open mind and this place is for you. If you are vulnerable, you have a vulnerability, something like that. And then we can change the mind of the people who are in the park and also the society around here, around him. Let me go just fast for some other picture. This is exactly the library when we open the door. And uh, this is the library at the office. And uh, sometime when we go in the place, we have a guitar, some stuff, artistic stuff. So, um, why we can change the atmosphere is just to offer people, just to let them uh, creativity, uh, to let their creativity go. So that they create their creativity uh, free flowing. So this person started playing music, creates a, a fun atmosphere for people. We just help them to create more energy. Very fast for send a picture to answer to your question. This is very special because it's the same park. And uh, if you are from the street, you just see like, uh, you think it's a garbage and stuff like this. And we decide to go inside their place because they have a sofa and stuff like this. And we realize, we realize they having a, already our setup for them, you know. And all we have to do is uh get there with our material and see how um, each person needs to uh, deposit their emotions because when we get there sometimes the atmosphere is kind of maybe kind of heavy so we give them uh, paper and uh, pens pencils crayons to allow them to draw as you see these people have made the mask that you could see uh, hanging there the mobile there and we install a table with the artistic material so our objective is not to transform the community and just to say, come, hey, they have a place there for you where you can just uh, be yourself. And I think if you are be yourself, you will help to change and make a better environment where you are. Voilà. Thanks so much, David. Really inspiring to see how people are getting to work with their hands, how you're reducing and eliminating barriers to participation in public space, making sure people feel welcome and included. Lots of really nice stuff here. I'm excited to hear more. Uh, but before that, we'll, we'll go over to you, Renee. Okay. So Common Ground Garden Project uh, began right in the middle of COVID. Uh, founder Art Van Zant and uh, was sitting in his office watching soccer on YouTube. And on the side feed where you see your next videos coming up, he saw a video called Plant It Forward of a brother and sister working in Houston, I believe, on an urban agriculture project and growing food for those in need, like the food bank and soup kitchens in their community. And so he thought, this is a lot better use of my time and will get me outside. So let's see if I can make that happen here. So he called up our city uh, social planning department, as we was connected with and had the conversation started. And from those two people, it then uh, included our Poverty Reduction Alliance to discuss the issue of food security and how this could be a great project in our community because the numbers showed that uh, 5,000 families in the Red Deer region are food insecure. So if you assume that four people make a family, that's 20,000 people, that's one fifth of our population or 20%. So it's a significant 
figure that most people aren't even aware of. So with that initial conversation, the social planning department helped facilitate uh, probably two dozen different stakeholders representing different organizations over the span of a year and a half. And in that time, had many conversations about what a project could look like. Uh, the city just happened to have space available in what we call the capstone area. So we've got about a four acre brownfield parcel that's the former home of electric light and power. So there's some contamination issues, but we like to say we're making lemonade when we're handed lemons. And of course we uh, you know, use our ingenuity and creativity together to come up with a design that created an above ground growing system essentially. So our whole project is mobile or movable. The other thing with our site is that we're on a 90 day out clause. So if the land sells because it's riverfront high value property, we have to find a new home. So the mobility of the project makes it really easy to do that. But if you're a gardener, you know that anything not growing in the ground is twice as hard to keep alive, to keep it watered and weeded and loved essentially. So that's where we've invited the community to be part of the project. So through elementary school engagements, through summer camps, and the school's coming back again in the fall, alongside uh, workshops for people from all walks of life, uh, working with our Immigrant Women's Association, our uh, Red Your Child Care uh, Center, and the African Caribbean Center of Central Alberta, just to name a few. We've developed some really strong relationships and facilitation practices to make essentially a replicable model for our project across the community and hopefully anywhere in Canada. So that's what we're hoping to do is, is take our success in this pilot, expand it uh, to multiple sites in our own community, but hopefully being a case study for other communities to learn from as well and apply where they live. So I have Thank a few you. slides to share with you just to kind of give you a picture of what it looks like. Oh, I have please. so many tabs open on my computer. I apologize. I have to find the right one. Bear with well, me. Bring it up. I'll, I'll just note, you know, like with the Action, you know, you're fulfilling multiple multiple well-being uh, impacts through place making uh, with this work. You know, you're um, transforming a space, uh, but you're doing it through uh, an effort to address food insecurity. Uh, and yeah, this speaks to the, the multiple impacts and powers of place making, which also makes it a little bit hard to pin down. But back to you. Right. So we're on about four acres, but the city learned halfway through us getting the garden going that there were some serious contamination issues that needed to be dealt with. So they bisected the site with construction fence. In spite of that, on the small footprint we did have access to, we were able to grow in the first year, mid-season start, 500 pounds of food. In 2022, we did 1,250 pounds, almost doubling our footprint in that space. And now with a set footprint this year, we grew 2,300 pounds. So if you look at our goal from our funders, what we were trying to produce was 1,000 pounds over the, all three growing seasons. We did over 4,000. So it's above ground, which makes it twice as hard, but our productivity was four times greater than what we anticipated. So where did all the food go? As I mentioned, the mustard seed as our local soup kitchen, the Red Deer Food Bank, and then to our indigenous elders and knowledge keepers and other volunteers that came and helped at the site. So you can see a picture of our Indigenous apprentice Megan there with her elders and how happy they were to receive that food. Uh, let's see here. So we were lucky to also have a relationship with Young Agrarians. So they're a Western Canada organization that helps connect youth with uh, farm placements and urban agriculture placements like we have. So in the pictures here, you can see Megan, uh, designed and installed with the help of the Indigenous elders a 30-foot medicine wheel garden, which was a beautiful finish to our footprint for what we have available space. We installed an earth loom and there's Jenica with her there working together as apprentices through Young Agrarians and weaving up the uh, string for the public art piece that that became. You can see it behind uh, Megan there in the bigger picture. And then Miranda on the right there helping us with our community composting initiative and showing off some of our premium worm castings we like to call gardeners gold. Our summer camp engagements were especially interesting because we tapped into a framework called permaculture principles. So you can see in the lower left there is the three ethics surrounded by the design principles. So the one exercise we picked to do one week of the summer camp over of course the eight weeks of the two months that summer is contained to here in, in Alberta is uh, the uh, Da Vinci Bridge and using the uh, principle of design from patterns to details. 
So we took paint sticks, paint stirring sticks from Home Depot and Rona and made a, a basic H pattern. So two vertical sticks and two horizontal sticks. And if we repeat that pattern, we can make a very unique structure that Da Vinci's credited for as the inventor. So we went from the paint sticks on the picnic table to pallet wood in the garden. And then on the right, you can see uh, a bridge crossing a creek or stream. And then in the lower right, you can see the actual uh, real world design in Norway with a pedestrian bridge. So very simple concepts and properties of tension and compression and showing kids that start small and grow from there and you can literally change the world much like Da Vinci did. So we're hopefully inspiring youth to be the next generation of innovators and placemakers. Our act of reconciliation I mentioned earlier about hosting indigenous engagements with our community. They were so popular that the attendance doubled after every one. And after the fourth session, we were actually able to host a harvest supper under the theme of a professional potluck where we had over 160 people bring food from their own kitchens together to collect and celebrate together. We erected a teepee, we had indigenous dancers and drummers and just really a magical atmosphere that people were sharing food and stories and just being together again after all that isolation. I think we're really hungry for that kind of stuff. And as I mentioned, it's, it's the opportunity for us to now take this model and apply it across our city and start really utilizing things like agrivoltaics where we can install solar systems and grow under them and harvest rainwater from them. Uh, and if you didn't know, our city had a motto back in the 50s when the City Hall Garden was established, they were referring to us as the Garden City because we had so much park space and actually over 25% of red deer is still in forested area. And then really trying to show people that they can be part of this, but they don't have to conform to one person's vision or one person's way of saying this has to be this way. This picture here is a mural mosaic. So obviously you can see the horse, but if you look closer, you can see that every single panel is another picture of a horse or horse themed image. And collectively they come together to make that shared vision. So what we're trying to share here is that vision of sustainability, of getting your hands in the soil, of reestablishing your relationship with the natural world, but also with each other. So that as we move forward together, through that act of reconciliation, we're better connected with the land. As we heal the land, the land heals us, and we create that harmony that I think we're all seeking to achieve. Thank you, Renee. Really powerful. And, and again, following a the theme of capacity building and, and just creating space for people to make what they would like of placemaking. With that, we'll go over to you, Kupcha, and uh, to learn more about the uh, Oppenheimer Bicycle Repair Clinic. Hi, thanks. Um, so one of the one of the things that I really love about this space was kind of how I got involved. Um, I got involved with them about yeah, a little over a year ago. Um, and at the time, I was actually living in a shelter and I was very, very secluded uh, socially. And I was uh, I was going through a lot of social anxiety and a lot of a lot of hard things, you know. And I I had one of the people at the shelter. They asked me if I was kind of like a, a handy person and if I knew how to work with bikes. And I was like, yeah, I've I've done done a, a little bit here and there. And uh, they offered me a connection to our community bikes because they were hosting a bike repair clinic at uh, the shipyards in North Vancouver. Um, and so I, I went and it, it was something that I got paid to go hang out with these beautiful folks. And right out of the gate, um, it, it was uh, these, these three wonderful people. They told me right out of the gate, they're like, listen, uh, we just really want you to know that uh, this is a safer space. We make we make sure that this is a place where where regardless of where you come from, who you are, how you identify, 
um, you know, wh whatever it is, whoever you are, you're safe here and this is a place for you to be, you know, and have some breathing room and breathing space and being, being a queer individual who was living in a shelter at the time, that was like really huge because that's not really, wasn't really a, a safe space for me to, to be out, you know, and when our community bikes brought me in to to do this bike repair clinic and they just said right out of the gate this is a safer space you know queer friendly beautiful be be who you want to be um it it immediately just became this this beautiful interaction where i was helping people put back together bikes and scooters and all of this stuff while being myself and holding space for me and holding space with the other people who were there. Um, and it was really beautiful because uh, I really needed that. I really needed that to start coming back into myself and out of the shell that I built up around myself. Um, and, and just literally just because of that one, one, two hour session, fixing bikes with them, uh, I fell in love with the company and when I have uh when I have the spoons I make sure that I head out there on you know the Sundays and Tuesdays that they they host and I don't always have the energy to to do the repairs themselves but often I will just go and sit and hold space for myself just being social with people because it, it's also a gathering space for the people who who come to get their bikes worked on. It's a community space where where people share stories and you know they get to connect and see friends that they haven't seen in a good while. And it's 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 beautiful because it's not just it's not just a bike repair clinic. You know, mo most a lot of the work that comes in are uh, like walkers or little scooters or carts that people use to bring their groceries home and stuff and you know there isn't there isn't a single day that goes by when when I'm volunteering where fixing something doesn't just like make someone happy it literally helps facilitate a transportation need that they have for their for their life because it's you know it's the downtown east side here in Vancouver and it's it's kind of a it's it's a definitely a lower income space and a lot of these folks need you know their bikes they need them to get their groceries they need them to get to work they need them to get places you know it's it's a huge huge part of their their life these these methods of transportation and um you know having elders come with like broken scooters and stuff and like you know they've been struggling and like yeah, just just being able to have them come to a space where you know just right next door there's a community space where they also have like coffee and snacks and often they'll have food there so just just being able to come to a space where they can come get their their items worked on and have just a good good safe space for them to be you know while while they're getting their things worked on is is really beautiful to see and yeah yeah, I thank think I'm going to leave that there for now. <laughs> thank you for sharing that deeply personal and very powerful story, you know, about making that space, about making the creating the the fertile opportunity and ground for for people to feel like themselves. It's so critical and a, a common thread through the the three stories that you've all shared. So so thanks to all of you, and I'll pass it over to Leah to to continue. Yeah, thank you so much for what's already been shared. There's so many well-being themes that have come out of these projects already around food security, poverty reduction, creating safe spaces for social connections, and connecting with individuals who might be in vulnerable situations. So again, you can see sort of the multifaceted impacts that placemaking can have in involving the community. And next, I'm wondering if the panelists would be able to share a bit about how the project has supported relationship or capacity building within the community. I wonder if Ide Acción would be willing to go first. 
Uh, if you want to start, I can build on what you say. Yes, I can begin. There's one thing that is very important. First of all, the practice community of uh, uh, meteors we have at Execo uh, meet every month. They meet every month to share their experience on the field. That's a very important issue. It allows them, first of all, to um to because you know unfortunately we get to know the people uh who are living on the street unfortunately it's always the same people so it, this monthly meeting allows us to share and uh to share stories and information about these people to better help them and we live in this community we're not the only ones trying to make these spaces uh, more sociable uh more fun more safe so we have a lot of partners in several uh, of the Montreal neighborhoods that we need to thank because it's, uh, we're evolving with them as well. We're not necessarily a first-line organization. So we are oftentimes supporting uh, other organizations and collaborating with them. So whether we uh, we collaborate with, uh, with uh, shelters, uh, food banks, different organizations, and we're constantly collaborating with them. We also work with institutions. We're always in a dialogue mode to try to assess the evolution of uh, these public spaces to see how we can improve them. So I'd like to thank the incredible work of these organizations and, and people. Go ahead, David. Thank you, Simon. As Simon said, the uh, places are in constant evolution. So for Ide Action Mobile, the transformation will happen, first of all, if we accept it within ourselves. Because one, when we get to a place, we have to, when we get to a park, or we need to be welcoming. And we also come with our own personal culture, our own uh, prejudice and sometimes uh, people there may not be very welcoming of our presence so we need to do the transformation in ourselves first then when we get to transform participants or other people it's not always visible it's not always our objective either i would say that this transformation can happen in an organic manner give you some example. Uh, at the mobile, we have some project inside Execo. We contribute with the, the Axel mobile, like this one with Espace Partagé. They uh, asked to some- uh, This one is called Share Spaces. Uh, question on the, on the postcard. And this question, we with uh, the Axel mobile, when we uh, visit the park and uh, metro station, we go to meet other Oslo's people and, and we ask them this question or we just ask them what they think about this question. So sometimes we have ask you a question is make you feel uh, comfortable, uncomfortable, automatically uh, increase a change inside yourself. But as I said before, we never know what's the impact we have, but our impact is always to have a better social cohabitation. But the objective is just to make a humanization inside the people. And if we they feel that, um, we will transform the way all they hack in this society. Uh, last thing I can say about that example with one of my colleagues, Jenny. Um, because different, uh, all the mediators and mediatrices, they have the way to to uh, to talk with the people. You know, it's the same mentality but different way to do. It. One, we came with the picture of Salvador Dali, and we was at the park and just asked the people what this picture means for you. You know, and uh, one woman, she was like pissed off. I don't want to answer, and like I um, feel aggressive. But she answered and she said, you know, this means for me, life is beautiful, even if I'm tired to live. And she started to cry and like um, all the emotions going. So the impact at the end 
if some example the police came to her later in the day or other people never came to her if she feel aggressive she may be respond by this aggressivity but the fact we was there she just let her know we're there what do you think about the picture and she had the possibility to let her emotions go oh maybe she will be transformed i don't know and maybe she will be more cool with the people in the park i don't know but all this many action we think we hope when you do a humanize les gens but ça va souvent when we humanize people it often goes uh, to improve them and uh, it improves their line of thought their uh, attitude and because we're not social um, responders we're not the police so sometimes i go to a park and I deal with people who uh, have taken drugs. I deal with drug dealers, with people who have been in prison, but I'm there to meet the human in them. And oftentimes these people will be, uh, will be uh, attacked on their uh, situation. Oh, you're uh, homeless, so you can't be there. Oh, you're a drug addict, you can't be there. So just the fact uh, that we're there and that we're trying to humanize people, this transforms people inevitably, and it transforms the place where they're all uh, living together. Thank you so much for sharing. And I'll just open it up to Renee and Kupcha if there's anything to add on how your project has contributed to capacity building. I think we just have a moment left on this before we'll switch into the next thing. I'll just add real quick in, in that regard. Um, one of the things that that our community bikes through the Oppenheimer bike repair clinic has has promoted is um quite a quite a bit more city engagement um when when the uh whether it's the city of vancouver or the city of north vancouver hosts public events um you know whether they're trying to to offer you know just public services. Um, often, the cities will reach out to uh, the bike repair clinic to ask them to pardon to participate in in a public event. Like uh, just last Friday, uh, Oppenheimer Park needed needed us to come by because they were hosting a lunch and they had haircuts going on and some other sorts of things. So when from holding space at Oppenheimer Park, um, you know, folks folks notice that that service is there, and people people remember that we're there, and they remember to reach out to our community bikes if they're holding if they're holding a community event, and they feel like oh maybe maybe this would be a really good fit to have have you know a repair clinic just just see if they want to come by and so it's it's something that happens every, every couple of months where we'll get a an inv invite to do that and uh beyond that there's also um something that uh Leia actually reminded me of which is that uh the the space hosts quite a few workshops that are geared not not just to everybody but also creating safer spaces for for uh women non-binary uh, and queer folks to be able to come to a space that's uh, being facilitated just for them uh, and and just having those kinds of mindful approaches uh, for integration for different aspects of the public or are, are, have been really neat to see within the space also. Thank you. Uh, I think for us, it's inherent in the name Common Ground. It's a space we can all feel at home at. And I think uh, we've set up the infrastructure for groups and individuals to come to the site and you know do whatever programming and engagement they'd like to with the inspiration of nature helping to guide that. And uh, for time's sake, I'll just boil it down to a George Bernard Shaw quote that uh, we're there to kind of feed each other. And the, the quote is, if I have an apple and you have an apple and we exchange apples, we each have one apple. But if I have an idea and you have an idea and we exchange ideas, we each have two ideas. So that's the goal I think of Common Ground is to bring people together to feed, feed each other both literally and figuratively so people can take those experiences back home and really create those environments in their very backyard. 
Thanks, Renee. And thanks to, to each of you for, for everything that you've been sharing here. It's so important to make that space to help to support that capacity as you're all touching on in the variety of ways that you work with the communities that you're serving. I just want to quickly touch on a couple of the comments that have come in um, from Rachel, placemaking, placeholding, space, holding space for ourselves. Beautiful. Uh, from Adriana, even the concept of an intentional space for repair is liberatory. Thank you for sharing your thoughts and insights. And from Karen, re repair clinics are powerful on so many levels, such a great expression of care alongside respecting labor and combat combating consumer disposability. And then just at the end from Susan, thank you for mentioning women in that summary, Kupcha. We're just about done for the, the time we have together want to open it back up to, to each of you to share something that you wish you had known when you started this or something that you think uh, somebody who might be in that starting position might benefit from based on the experiences that you've had. So really a chance to you know share your knowledge and, and anything that you think is important to get started. And I'm going to just open it up for whoever would like to speak first. Um, I think for me, the most powerful thing that that I noticed kind of right away was just just networking. How, how important networking is. How important it is to to be able to to push yourself to to reach out. You know, because worst case scenario, someone doesn't have the time or the energy for the thing. Best case scenario, you know, you're gonna find yourself with a bit of a surprise, and there's just so much power in integrating other other folks perspectives and just being able to learn from each other through through that kind of uh, just that, that kind of collaboration you know, beautiful ideas get to get to come out and we all get to learn so much just from being exposed to to how other folks are approaching things in in meaningful ways and creating beautiful impact so Wonderful. Thank you, Kepcha. And again, this is speaking to having that space available. So just how important projects like Oppenheimer Bicycle Repair Clinic and our community bikes are. I think for us, it was uh, coming out of the pandemic in a, uh, a mindset that we had never really experienced before, at least those generations alive today. And how do we engage each other uh, without the supporting invisible infrastructure. So for us specifically, it was having like a, a really good onboarding process for volunteers to set expectations, the ground rules, you know, whose role is what and how those roles work together, because there was a lot of uh, lack of clarity on what each person was going to do and how they had that vision in their mind of what this project should be. So it was really, I think, lacking that picture I shared with you guys of the Euro Mosaic of how, you know, a shared vision really works together. So having that process in place before getting all ramped up and doing something, I think would be invaluable, but we also learn from making mistakes. So it's a bit of a balancing act between that and making mistakes, but having the patience and the forgiveness for the transgressions we cause each other through, you know, our energy being uh, thrown around. Thank you for sharing that as well, Renee. It's, you know, getting started, we all make mistakes. We learn so much from those mistakes, often more from them than from the successes. And also I think what I'm hearing here is just the importance of the process and having that process in place and how important it is. And we'll, we'll hand it over to you, Simon and David, to, to wrap up. Go ahead, Simon, I can what you say afterwards um, I really like the comment uh, of, uh, to René because uh, it's very important uh, for us also for our, our posture because uh, we have to accept uh, we are not comfortable to you know and uh, I think we don't have to uh, blind us from our emotion and uh, to feel like we have to save everything because me I just started in this uh, environment because I was in politics and fashion before 
and uh, I realize uh, my contradiction of about what I'm thinking and something, and I just like, oh my God, what do I do? But uh, I just have to accept and like, and you say, okay, maybe I'm gonna make a mistake. And I think the humanization, you can, tu peux humaniser la personne si tu es capable de humanize if you can others if you can humanize yourself. Another thing I'd like to say. Because uh, I was in a panel at like, the Park People Conference, and uh, most of people in the city they say, "Oh, it's difficult because we're so busy to understand how we can manage with people." And I think we just have to understand first. For us, when we go to the park, metro station, directly on the street to meet the houseless people, we understand we have to knock to the door to their house because the street, the park, the the le banc dans le metro, c'est leur maison. The uh, seats in the metro, or that's their home. So people are in this position, even if we say this person is sleeping on the floor, it's a public place, it is still their home. So we need to knock on the door of their home. So maybe in this way to approach the other, maybe the other will refuse. Maybe I will not be welcomed by that person. So we need to respect all these feelings, contradictory feelings among humans and uh, remove prejudice. The person who's homeless, may be uncomfortable because she uh, looks vulnerable. She doesn't know how to behave. She doesn't feel comfortable asking for help. It doesn't mean that she doesn't want to respect rules or doesn't want to listen to you. It doesn't mean that. And I think these um, people in a situation of homelessness or uh, people who have a house. Two human in a different situation how we can talk together and not say, oh, this is less. This is not a generation, it's not a, ce n'est pas un, 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 un amalgam de, de personnes itinérantes. It's not a, an aggregate of different people. It's different stories. We have different experiences that meet in public spaces. And then we need to trust that the relationship will develop and we need to have, uh, having this humanity will be uh, easier in positive uh, mindset than in, than in negative mindsets. Definitely. Definitely. Thank you, David. Thank you all. This, this has been so powerful to hear from, from your experiences, your learnings, your insights. You know, just to quickly touch on what David said, but I think it's come up in all of your stories, but the importance of approaching people with humanity, with dignity with respecting the fact that you may be in someone's home when you're at that space and just how powerful initiating with openness and trust can be and making the space for people to feel comfortable. We're just about done today. We really appreciate that you took the time to, to join us all. So, so thank you so much. Um, you've shared so much. Um, we have more information, material, data, evidence, and stories at uh, at the website, which I think the link has been shared a few times. Um, I'm just going to quickly wrap up by saying thank you to uh, the Healthy Communities Initiative for making the space to, to do this important work, to Community Foundations of Canada and Michelle Bridger for the support, to the Canadian Urban Institute and Gabriella for all that you have done and everybody else at CUI who's on the back end. Really appreciate all of that. And, and with that, I'll pass it over to you, Gabriella, for last word. Thank you, Mitchell, and, and thank you all of us for joining today. This has been amazing, more than we what we can ever dream of when we plan this session. Um, thank you very much for grounding us. And thank you very much also for kind of like creating the conditions for the launch of these resources. At the end of the day, these resources are stories. And we want to make sure these re resources support your own efforts as place in place making in order to tell your own stories. So we hope we will be able to continue supporting and building this momentum and shining kind of like the light on all of those of you who are already doing the work on the ground and who have such amazing stories um, and experiences and learning to share with all of us. 
We will be following up with all of you with a short survey to learn a bit more about what went well on the session, to share with you further information about all the resources that we are launching today, and also to share with you the recording of the session, which will be available. Um, in that email, we will also include a couple of notes. Uh, the Canadian Urban Institute is hosting a summit uh, soon on November 30th. So we will make sure we share with you also all that information. And I think, again, I just want to say thank you for everyone here um, and also everyone who has been part of this process. This is just the start of an ongoing conversation and we hope that is the case and we hope we can continue learning with you all. So we hope to see you soon. Thank you very much and take care.